are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis, I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and uh, chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Uh, today is Friday, March 4th, and we will be hearing the presentation, The Central Social District, the key to tomorrow's uh, successful downtown. For technical help during today's webcast, please type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number. And for your content questions related to the presentation, please type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And please indicate which speaker you would like to answer the question. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts uh, possible and free to members. Uh, today's webcast is sponsored by the Wisconsin chapter. To learn more about all our chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. And to learn about divisions, planning.org slash divisions. Uh, on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts coming up shortly. Uh, to register for these webcasts, visit our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast and you can also see a complete list of our upcoming webcasts on our web page as well. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast visit planning.org and uh, planning.org slash CM. The best thing to do is go to activities by provider up at the top type in the Wisconsin chapter and then today's session will show up or you could try just searching the event number because APA is launching a new website in the near future, it can get a little fuzzy whether entering just the ID number will work or not. So best bet, activities by provider, Wisconsin chapter. And this webcast has been approved for one and a half CM credits for live viewing only. And we do have recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. And again, to see that, to get the links, visit our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming events. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube to get a video of that. And uh, we will have a PDF of the PowerPoint available after the end of the presentation. And it will be available on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, with that, I would like to quickly introduce our speakers so we can get started. Uh, up first is David Milder. David is the president of DANF, Inc. He has been a downtown revitalization specialist for over 40 years and the author of books on reducing downtown fear of crime, niche revitalization strategies, and downtown business recruitment, as well as many articles published in Urban Land, the Economic Development Journal, Main Street News, and the Downtown Idea Exchange. Up next is Andrew Dane. He's a senior planner and community development specialist with Short Elliott Hendrickson, an employee-owned engineering, architecture, and planning firm with 750 staff working nationwide. He specializes in downtown waterfront revitalization, including public participation, planning, and implementation services. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you, Christine. Andrew, uh, next slide, please. Uh, most of us uh, see our downtowns in terms of uh, it being our central social district. For many years, uh, the two terms seem to be almost uh, uh, used interchangeably in common parlance. Uh, and what is, I have noticed over the last, say, five to ten years, certainly beginning before the Great Recession, is that uh, under the new normal for our downtowns, which has 
emerged uh, after our, uh, the Great Recession that the CBD functions, i.e. the kind of things like retail and offices, banking, etc., uh, they have become uh, kind of less important for the success of the downtown, while a set of other functions, which might be called the central social district functions, are beginning to get, uh, to, uh, get stronger and stronger, uh, more and more popular, and coincide with uh, more and more of the successes of our downtowns across the country. Next slide, please. Why is this happening? Well, uh, for retail, uh, retailers are being impacted negatively by two things. First of all, there's the internet. Uh, which is taking customers away and also which is directing a lot of the uh, customer behavior so they're doing less browsing in the stores, they are doing researching things online, coming to the store to either pick up goods they've bought or to uh, buy things they've already decided they wanted to before their computer screens. Secondly has been the emergency emergence of um, of what we call the deliberate consumer. I'm sure many of you already know that middle-class America, uh, had the, their annual household incomes have been stagnant for decades now. Uh, and this has had an impact on what can they can buy and their discretionary dollars that they have available. Uh, also what happened is that during the Great Recession, they kind of were shocked into uh, a, a, a shift in concern away from uh, uh, wants when, and more towards needs when they were going into their shopping behavior. Uh, a lot of impulse paid, uh, buying, a lot of trading up buying uh, uh, has, has almost uh, uh, disappeared. The set, because of that, the retailers are feeling this and they're looking for fewer locations. Fewer new stores, they're opening fewer new stores, and the new stores they do open uh, have less space, they're smaller, and the retailers are also, uh, you know, they're less liable to uh, try a bit more risky locations. They want st uh, locations that are proven, uh, that they can go into with great assurance that their stores there are going to be successful. A similar thing is happening in offices. You know, we never, we seldom think about the fact that the way people work is going to impact what the office demand is going to be and how our offices operate. You know, the kind of now new big office spaces. Uh, people are doing a lot more telecommuting, although it, 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 it's temp, it's only partial part of their work week. It, it isn't, you know, the, the sole way uh, that they work. Um, the office spaces they, uh, are less uh, with individual offices, they're more open spaces, etc. Uh, people are now sharing desks, uh, firms are reducing their office space requirements per, per uh, square footage per worker, uh, and as a result of that, uh, uh, the kind of office space that they're looking for means a lot of old office buildings are out of date, and a lot of those in, have, in many downtowns are now being changed into residential uses. So the whole nature, now this is less going to happen less in smaller downtowns, etc. cetera, um, but where any instance where you have any kind of significant size office buildings, uh, this is being felt. Next, Andrew. So what is your CSD? Well, you know, Back in ancient times, back in the days of the Greeks and the Romans, there were always central meeting places within the communities. There was the either the Greek agora, or the Roman forums, and even in uh, more primitive societies, there's a village well, etc. Well, in a way, your central social district is that kind of central meeting place within your downtown, and it is performing certain functions uh, for the whole community. It's the downtown area that has venues that make it easy for people to have enjoyable experiences with other people, especially those that they really care about. And one of the things that we're also observing is that more and more uh, 
you know, people look, they're so, we're so busy these days uh, that uh, being able to have a quality time with one's loved ones uh, and people one cares for uh, gets often you know, more difficult and to have good uh, kind of uh, venues where that can be facilitated and, and maximize the enjoyment, uh, they are great, greatly deeply appreciated. And so what we find is, you know, uh, across the country that downtown uh, housing is more uh, popular, downtown restaurants are, are growing in popularity, and, and in fact, people going out to restaurants is, is increasing in popularity. Now, uh, the new statistic that always struck, that struck me as being very interesting is we're now spending more money on eating out than on, on uh, eating at home. Uh, quite a turn of events. Next, please. These are some of the components of a central uh, social district. These are the types of venues that perform the central social di district functions. And they range from housing and movie theaters, of you know, things that we call formal entertainment venues, like movie theaters, packs, concert halls, museums, art galleries, arenas, stadiums, etc., to informal entertainment areas like parks, public spaces, uh, and then we have things like restaurants, social clubs, catering halls, school libraries, or uh, schools and libraries. Libraries are often underestimated in, in both their importance to the community and, and as as uh, social meeting places and congregation places, and even getting into co-worker spaces, accelerators, and incubators. Another that's uh, a kind of venue that's often overlooked is what I call pamper niche venues. You know, gym and hail a nail and hair salons, often derided by downtown folks. Oh, we don't want those. Well, they bring in a lot of uh, um, people with ex with red readily available expend expenditure dollars, and also in many places that we've worked, these become social. Uh, important congregation points, and if you want news, gossip, or whatever to 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 uh, be disseminated, they're often uh, a good venues to look at. Restaurants are probably the pivotal, pivotal, <laughs> excuse me, pivotal niche uh, for many, many downtown revitalization efforts, and often uh, their importance is not properly appreciated. Next, please. Uh, in, in the next um, couple of slides, I just want to pick out on a couple of public spaces and parks um, to give you an idea of what can be done and what it costs and why they're, you know, these are really nice uh, and, and community building uh, for central social district kind of functions. Uh, and these are all in uh, small towns, rel uh, uh, relatively small, medium-sized towns. The first one is Mitchell Park in Greenport, New York, which has a year-round population of about 2,200. It grows to about 2,800 in the summertime. It's on the eastern end of Long Island. It's on the water, former whaling port. has a lot of tourists coming through it. They built a park that, as you can see here, it has that the house up near the top, the circular building, is a carousel house. Uh, it has a marina. Uh, and a winter skating rink, uh, which in the summertime is an out, uh, outdoor amphitheater where they have you know, public performances. Uh, it costs about $14.9 million to build, uh, and it costs about a million dollars a year to operate, but most of those costs are recovered by the fees for the carousel, the skating rink, and especially uh, the marina. And it, 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 uh, it has draws about 300 to 400,000 people a year uh, to the community. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Andrew? Now, Division Street in uh, Somerville, New Jersey, which has a population of about 12,000, is really uh, interesting because it's one of the few successful, what you might call a pedestrian mall. Uh, it was done within the last couple of years. It cost a relatively affordable, uh, not terribly high price, about $670,000. It costs even less, about $62,000 to operate annually. 
uh, the street, uh, which was a problem street for many, many years. Um, people thought of it as being uh, kind of on the on the road to decay. Uh, there were it was fear of crime, etc. Now there are businesses there are populating the available spaces. There's overstore residential activity and office activity. Their business are drawing, we estimate, between 116 and 128,000 uh, uh, patrons a year. And the events on the, on the plaza itself uh, are bringing in uh, 100,000 visitors. Now, what you're seeing here is an event that the folks there in the downtown bid uh, that they created and they're drawing in. Andrew, can we go back a second to uh, to the uh, uh, Mitchell Park? Uh, uh, Mitchell Park, anyway, uh, what you have there is what you might call physical programming. Uh, that is, they build in facilities like the skating rink, like the, uh, 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 the carousel, uh, that enables people to do activities. It is the physical structures and opportunities there that allow people to do the do things and do the performances and that's how it's programmed. You don't have to have an event uh, uh, to do the program. You can have the physical uh, outlay of the spot to do the programming uh, program as well to, and to provide the entertainment. Next please. Uh, Central Park Plaza in, in uh, Valparaiso, Indiana is a project, by the way, that uh, Andrew's firm, SEH, uh, did. Uh, it's a park that now uh, was so successful that it, it started off with an amphitheater, and a, a phase two has recently added an ice rink and a catering facility. This is the amphitheater. Uh, it has a cost of about 3.25 to build phase one, and they, they had the, new, the second phase was about $4 million. It has operating costs about uh, close to a half a million dollars before the that was for phase one. I don't know what this phase two uh, costs are. Uh, and while the city provides about a hundred thousand uh, dollars of that cost in, in, during the phase one operation, um, most of that was recuperated by uh, uh, fees that they were, were um, uh, um, getting in. And the, the events were being raised by, uh, run by a, a downtown organization. It had in 2014 about uh, 130,000 uh, visitors. Next. Now, one of the things you know, that, that if you're planning to do, uh, if you're a small, medium-sized town, and you, you're planning to build your your central social district, you're going to need some organizational capability, and you need a, a fairly viable one. And you know our analysis, and these three examples show, is that local government action is essential, uh, and that uh, our analysis shows that those that have had experience in dealing with four B, four fee business-like services are more likely to succeed and be interested in, in taking on uh, these types of projects. Um, the, in these three communities, the village or town government always played a pivotal role. In Somerville, a bid was uh, really the one that take, took, took on the, uh, the lead of it uh, 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 and ran with it. And in uh, Valparaiso, uh, the downtown business group uh, really it, it has uh, the, the main responsibility for activating uh, uh, the park. Next. Well, another key and question has to be asked about these downtown venues, uh, and not just for these parks and public spaces, but if you're going to go into a, 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 a rejuvenating a, a movie theater or a town hall, uh, a pack or a, a theater or uh, a museum or whatever. Uh, how are they going to be fan financed? And uh, Greenport's Mitchell Park operations uh, this, this shows that you know uh, they got about four million from the village government, uh, and then they were successful in getting 25 plus grant grants and donations, um, and uh, all of these have a varied uh, sources of funding. Uh, there's no one source that is going to do the trick. Uh, and in order to uh, 
get those additional funds, usually some town money, some the town has to have some skin in the game if, if the project is going to be successful. Another thing that you, I've, we've noticed is, boy, when TIFs are good in a state and you have good TIF legislation, uh, these projects uh, can be considerably held from, from that funding mechanism. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you know, you have to be really you can have to be uh, invent inventive. Uh, but there are lots of funding uh, uh, streams that can be tapped, uh, and you have to be prepared that you're going to have usually to tap a number of them to go forward. Next. I'm a movie fanatic. I, I fess up. Uh, I'm also a downtown fanatic. And what I've noticed over my 40 years in the business is that, you know, in too many communities, downtown theaters, which are vital treasures, are, are often under threat or have closed. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, one of the reasons that it happens is that the downtown organization and local leaders are not prepared soon enough uh, to act uh, in the time frame that's necessary once the, the theater gets in danger. On the positive side, you know, these downtown theaters are going to draw about 50,000 patrons per year per screen. They provide an affordable entertainment. Most Americans can afford to go to the movies. And they're good for the downtown because they're open days and evenings and weekends, so their traffic are, are bringing in traffic when businesses and restaurants are open. They have very relatively few what we call user frictions. That is impediments to put to people, local populations, local citizens to you to using. But from the movie studio's point of view, they're really, and this may surprise some of you, they're really not very important from a revenue perspective. They they only account for about 14 to 16 percent of the movie studio uh, studio's annual revenue. That's the domestic theaters, okay? Their value that rests more in terms of the marketing platform they provide. You know, so the, the, the shows the, uh, in the movie theaters and, and the, the talk about it, and, uh, uh, et cetera, that's what helps get uh, more money from the other streams the, uh, on TV, uh, selling videos on online or DVDs. Etc. And that's where the movie studio and, and and as ancillary products like the lightsabers for Star Wars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's where the movie theaters um, make most of their money. Move and also most movies are not watched in movie theaters. They're watched at home. And uh, uh, cinema attendance has been in uh, in decline. It's not growing in actual terms. And on a per capita basis, it's really declined. Next. The challenge is to keep your cinemas open, vibrant, and profitable. And because, let me tell you, if you, to get a new theater in a small and medium-sized town these days is really, really difficult. Now, a couple of years ago, movie theaters had passed through what was called the digital divide. They shifted from using film in their projectors to using digital equipment to, to project onto their screens. And many communities, uh, you know, initially it, it could cost up to $60,000, $100,000, $200,000 per screen to, to make this transition. And many communities had their theaters uh, 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 being threatened. And they, through the use of crowdfunding, or community-owned businesses that Josh Bloom has written about, or creating opportunities for patrons to make a night, uh, a, a not, kind of a night of it, a special night out, uh, and tie-ins with nearby eateries and and improved public spaces. They these are strategies they've used to help um, make their theaters uh, be able to make the transition through the digital divide and otherwise to stay stable and safe. But it's really a good idea for these movie theaters to have a viable rescue plan, at least the outlines of one, um, ready to go should anything um, emerge. I mean, it, there could be a six to eight, a twelve week period in which you know uh, the deal is done and you have no time at all to, 
to uh, uh, to stop uh, its closure, uh, and it's certainly not enough time to form a coalition, get a good game plan going, uh, etc. So you really need to have a kind of a, a get-go plan, rescue plan ready at hand. Next, please. Now, not all attempts at CD, CSD growth are going to be successful. Um, you know, you can go out and travel, you know, take a day trip around your, your home uh, community and you'll find lots of successful examples of successful movies and packs and theaters, etc. But there's also, I'm afraid, you know, equal probability that you can find those that have failed or uh, those more likely even, those that are struggling financially or struggling to maintain their audiences. Um, there have been some entertainment, you know, some formal entertainment venues uh, uh, that uh, have been uh, built and had support based on that they were going to provide high culture. And what they found was that uh, you know, it was more about entertainment. Um, and, uh, you know, I was active in one community that um, they talked about renovating a theater and they were, you know, uh, initially there was, you know, discussions about how they were going to bring in Broadway shows and, and symphonies and ballet companies, etc. And now it is the theater, uh, after struggling, uh, is financially stable and successful, but the main draw there are comedians. Um, and so you, know, you have to be able to know what your uh, audience base is interested in, um, where it's going to go, uh, otherwise you're going to have some real uh, financial pressures. There, as I said before, there are many, many failed pedestrian malls and plazas. Frankly, with the pedestrian malls, uh, uh, a lot of people are scratching their heads what makes the few that are successful, and they are very successful like Church Street in, in Burlington, Vermont, and Third Street uh, in uh, Santa Monica. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, but uh, if you're going in these areas, uh, you have to do it correctly. Uh, there's also an, uh, another kind of a, a po a possible uh, de uh, difficulty. Uh, in one of the towns that we recently worked in, uh, they have a very success, very for, for a town of that so, of its size. They have a very successful conference and convention center that draws about 50,000 visitors a year. But because the way the conference center is built and operates, it has very little in, impact on nearby merchants or on nearby businesses, uh, and lots of other uh, in lots of other downtowns that have arenas and convention centers. Uh, have the same kind of uh, uh, of impact. Uh, they bring, they build blank wall, large blank walls. They bring in an audience that is either captive for the whole day and does not go out when the merchants are open, or they bring in customers and patrons when the stores are are closed. Uh, so the you know the impacts, the economic impacts on the downtown merchants that are anticipated that initially mobilized the support never transpires. Next. So, you know, growing your central social district, uh, if you want it, and I, th and I guess the whole thrust of my presentation here is that uh, uh, this is really the best strategic uh, uh, approach for future downtown growth from most downtowns in America, uh, that um, you, you really have to uh, know what you're doing to have a good plan, a good strategy, uh, know uh, your audience, etc. And you also have to know which of your your existing components, uh, which of your those venues in your community have the greatest growth potentials, economic viability, and having positive impacts on the your, the the way the economics of your downtown. You also have to look at what some your possible new components would be, um, and, and uh, some of them will be easier to to create and easier to maintain. Um, 
um, some of the key variable, you know, for instance, um, it may be that creating a, um, a downtown public space uh, could cost um, much less money um, and it costs much less than um, to operate and brings in as many people as a, as a big public formal um, uh, entertainment venue like a, um, a pack or a theater uh, and uh, you know which can you afford uh, what's gonna, what is it going to cost which is easier to build what's easier to operate uh, what are the audiences that they can attract when will they attract uh, how do they interact with other parts of the downtown next please Um, a good thing to look at when you're contemplating uh, what, uh, which are the components of a downtown uh, a CSD you're going to try and bring in new or to facilitate is what we call is what their user frictions are. And these examples are from New York, the Bryant Park, the Lincoln Center, uh, Museum of Modern Art, Madison Square Garden, Broadway theaters, and movie theaters. And those are the venues in New York, um, and down the left-hand column, the, these are the, 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 the computer the, the, the user frictions. Well, one of the most important ones is what the operating hours are. Uh, you know, if they are going to be closed uh, most of the time when your businesses are open, then they're not going to have much impact on those businesses. Um, and when they're open for longer hours, it means that it's easier for your uh, for, for the audience members to go and visit them and to use them. So you know, Bryant Park is almost almost uh, is open almost all the time uh, compared to a Broadway theater, which is uh, open you know uh, f uh, five, two afternoons per week and and six or seven nights a week. Uh, uh, Madison Square Garden is closed most days only open at night. Uh, museums, they're open during the day, but only uh, only recently have even started to go at night. Um, another one is, is uh, uh, friction is admission fees. Uh, some of the costs to go to events uh, can be very expensive for the given community uh, that they're occurring in. Now these are New York prices and I doubt a few other places have them, but still admission fees is one of the determinants of who is going to use the venue when it comes in. Another uh, 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 and often overlooked uh, uh, friction is, does the um, user's schedule drive the visit to the venue? Uh, I can go to Bryant Park anytime I want. It's always open. It's always there. I can go to Museum of Modern Art um, every day now, but I can't go in the night. In the night. But if I want to go to a play, or I have to get a ticket for a special day. If I want to go a concert, it's what I have to get a, a, a make an appointment in, in essence. So it doesn't. My, it isn't my schedule is driving when I'm going. It's when I can adjust my my schedule to when there are available visits. And the final friction I'm citing here is: Are there opportunities? to make vis visits that are either spontaneous or that will last 45 minutes or, or later. For downtowns, this is really important because research has shown that there are a lot of visitors that need to fill in uh, uh, um, down times in their schedules and the visits to the downtown. Uh, and these are usually for, for 45 minutes or, or less. So if you have venues that can fill that need, that gap, uh, you are going to make them happier visitors uh, to your downtown uh, and more probably more frequent visitors. Next, please. It, this goes in to give you some, some pack, comparative costs of renovating entertainment venues in, in various cities. I'm using um, Newark as uh, here because it was frankly easiest for me at the point to, to collect these uh, uh, data. Uh, and uh, um, I don't claim that these are representative, but I do think they're kind of indicative. Um, 
And you know, if you look here, the big projects, the big bang projects of uh, the Prudential Arena uh, and the uh, New Jersey PAC, uh, they cost hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, to uh, to create, and they bring in uh, folks who are going to be there mostly in the evening time, not during the daytime. They're going to uh, often be quick in, quick out. They're going to go to the event in their car. Maybe they'll eat downtown, maybe not, and, and off they're going. The military park innovation is downtown. It can service the people, the workforce who's there. The visitors are also uh, there. Uh, it is reinforcing the attractiveness of being in the, in the downtown. The difference there is it only costs $5 million to do. It's a new renovation and my, frankly, my assessment is I'm betting that the park renovation is going to have a more favorable impact on the revitalization of Newark than the two bigger projects. Here, if you look here um, below, you know, uh, uh, theater projects are not uh, 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 insignificant. Uh, they can uh, even in smaller communities, uh, 3.5 million. That was in Rutland 2000. In today's dollars is probably uh, uh, probably at least 50 percent more. Um, and the cost of the uh, of the um, some of the smaller uh, public space projects like Division Street and Central Park Plaza are uh, are are lesser. The cost of Mitchell Park was quite different. Uh, they had uh, they were going in for a more intensive infrastructure um, kind of uh, 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 that would stimulate the, the you know kind of programming, um, physical pro programming of park visitors, and they also had uh, brownfield issues that they uh, had to take care of. Next, please. Now the different. Now this is a pattern that we've found, and I want to show here is that the formal entertainments, uh, uh, the the, par the stadiums, the museums, the parks, etc., they cost more than the parks and uh, and public spaces um, uh, per visitor to operate. So of the of the of those that are situated here in the larger communities. The average cost among the formal entertainment venues, that is you take the budget of the management corporation and you divide it by the number of visitors, it, the average is $90.67. The informal venues, the park, Bryan Park, etc., they're all under two and a half dollars. Quite a difference. Which one is easier likely for, uh, for, uh, 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 for the community to afford? Next. And the same pattern occurs if you look in smaller communities. Um, and here in the, in the formal venues that I was able to identify, it's obviously lower. Only the average is 45 bucks. But the but the entertainment uh, informal among the uh, formal entertainment venues, but in the informal entertainment informal entertainment venues, uh, it, it's uh, only a dollar 99. Uh, um, so in, in a smaller community, the, it's going to be a lot easier to uh, cover the operating costs per given given the bang for the buck that you're going to get. Uh, the, the informal venues appear to be better. Next, please. Restaurants, as I said before, are really really critical to success in downtowns, and in smaller areas, uh, smaller towns. Uh, they are usually viable um, because uh, they require uh, uh, the, the individual operation has to win a smaller share of the market um, than uh, other types of uh, retail uh, uh, ventures in order for them to succeed. Uh, here's some data from a, a study Andrew and I did up in in Wisconsin, Sherwood, Wisconsin, a new restaurant would have to win 28% of the local, local market, a consumer market, in order to be successful. Uh, an apparel niche uh, store would have to win 167% of the market. Of, of, of the, market. Uh, the same with home and hearth niche. 
So the, the lower market share allows more, it's easier for people to come in, uh, but they also have higher fail, or failure rates, so you're going to have a lot of churn there. Uh, also in smaller communities, they have lower rent and labor costs, uh, so that makes them uh, um, e and easier to go. But uh, th there are other factors like the more difficult, greater difficulty of getting good staff for um, for uh, restaurant kitchens, etc., uh, that are, that are uh, makes it success more difficult. Next, please. Well, what's next for your uh, downtown and your uh, central social district? Uh, are you ready to do the planning and, and strategy development that you're going to need? Um, you know, you, you have to recognize. I think is the first part, what you already have there. It's always to build better and easier to build on existing strengths than to try and create something new. Uh, and you know, what is it that you can do in the short term? Which are the kind of components of a central social district that you can bring in that are going to be effective, most affordable, most financially feasible and most cost effective. If you can build up a base of vibrant central social district functions, it can be uh, um, a, a restaurant base, it can be a combination with public spaces, it might be uh, stepping up your movie theater, whatever. Can you do that and, and the strength that that brings in, can that then uh, lead you to be able to take on larger scale projects that otherwise would not have the community uh, support or or the penetration into a larger trade area, uh, etc. And also, I think that uh, one of the most in, important things to th that uh, any community has to do in any kind of revitalization, whether you're doing CBD revitalization type revitalization or CSD, is You've got to know what the limits are to your uh, to your your growth aspirations. Uh, that you know, dirty, I think of Dirty Dirty Harry's uh, admonition: uh, "Man's got to know his limits." Um, often uh, in, in these situations, it's really important to calibrate uh, your aspirations to what your real potentials are. And finally, you know, what what help are you, you going to need? Uh, what other outside resources? What other skills are you going to need? What other outside knowledge are you going to need? Next, please. Andrew, it's you. Your time. So here, right. folks. Great, David. Make sure to um, my, uh, mute your microphone. And uh, <clears throat> great job. Um, so I'm uh, Andrew. Dane and <clears throat> apologize I'm getting over the end of a cold um, but uh, I've had the pleasure of working with David Milder on a couple of different projects and um, uh, and I wanted to share a couple of case studies of the Central Social District one of them is kind of a personal case study called the 602 Club which is um, I'll talk about in just a minute and the other is, is a, a new project I'm working on professionally for <clears throat> downtown Appleton Wisconsin both of these, I thought, highlighted a couple of the key principles of the Central Social District that David just talked about. And one was, first is really the focusing on the people part and kind of the first and foremost um, uh, element of creating a Central Social District strategy is really understanding what, what the people component is. Um, the second principle being lighter, quicker, cheaper, uh, and sometimes, so sort of piggybacking on the concept of pop-ups and tactical urbanism and uh, the other buzzwords out there. Um, how do we do things um, faster and quicker and cheaper uh, versus sitting around and waiting for some magic uh, to come out of the sky? And then third is just the, the idea of mixing it up, uh, mixed use, um, uh, different di bringing diverse programming together, uh, integrating different uses um, uh, into your social, um, into a central social district. So the first case, the case study number one here is the 602 Club, and um, this is a project that uh, <clears throat> I started about uh, 18 months ago, 16, 18 months ago. This is a personal project I've been involved with. Um, this is a um, building uh, on the right, um, 
not the building on the left, <coughs> that uh, was a dilapidated, rundown um, a home, about uh, 3,000 square feet, fairly large Victorian house. It's actually zoned commercial and located in a little neighborhood commercial district um, in uh, actually near downtown Appleton. Um, this property had been um, flipping through, uh, <clears throat> basically degenerated into into a, a drug house, and had been um, uh, rotating through a number of tenants. And um, myself and a couple, another couple, myself, my wife, and another couple in the neighborhood um, saw this place uh, sort of quickly going downhill. So when it came up on the market for purchase, we uh, got kind of excited about it and thought we would um, try to acquire this property. Uh, so we bid on this uh, on this property on auction.com um, August before last. Uh, we bid it out for $60,000 and ended up coming into, into possession of this property. Um, this property in some ways I think is, is um, typical of um, a lot of smaller and mid-sized uh, properties in, in downtowns. Uh, as well as in sort of neighborhood commercial areas where you have deteriorated building stocks, blighted commercial buildings. Um, and furthermore, um, it's, uh, while it is located in a little commercial sort of crossroads um, that where there's a very successful meat market and a um, dog grooming store and a little IT business, um, the, the neighborhood itself doesn't offer a lot in the way of um, gathering places or destinations to make the neighborhood more um, walkable. And so um, typical sort of scenario here is that <clears throat> you tear these places down, uh, which happens all the time in, in my neighborhood and communities across the country, um, or uh, perhaps a city comes in, a developer comes in, or a downtown group comes in and tries to market a property like this to reactivate it, create incentives for business startups. Um, in this case, uh, once we took possession of this of the home here, um, the initial thought was trying to do something positive for the neighborhood, uh, positive um, for the community was to create a coffee shop, uh, which again I think is a fairly typical um, response. And uh, oftentimes when I work in communities and we ask people, what are you looking for in your downtown, uh, what's missing, it's usually a coffee shop. and um, as I've worked in more and more communities, I've, I've come to sort of uh, understand that that's really code for uh, we need a social gathering place. We want a stronger central social district. Uh, we looked at a number of different um, coffee operators, and we tried to bring lure a few of them in. Um, but due to the cost, the high costs of the building um, uh, uh, tenant improvements that would be necessitated and some of the code challenges, um, again, like many communities, um, it's just simply not economically viable to uh, to take a, one of these older properties and get a get a business in there uh, like a coffee shop that's going to be financially viable. <clears throat> so instead of um, going down that route, um, or, or rather, it, as we were trying to lure in a, a coffee operator, um, talking to different folks, we started to do some. Uh, we started to just do some events um, and start programming this, this space. And so after it was cleaned out, um, the first event we held was a little uh, pumpkin carving uh, um, for the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, this was uh, friends, but it was also acquaintances and, and just people from the surrounding neighbors who were curious what was going on. So we started to do some little events like pumpkin carving. Um, this being Wisconsin, uh, we started hosting some Packer parties and uh, uh, inviting people in to uh, watch Packer parties. Uh, this, um, it, after a couple of these, we were having uh, some people were interested in attending and, and, and seeing what was going on. We ended up crowdsourcing, crowdfunding for a new TV. And so we put up on our Facebook page a request uh, for people to chip in 5, 10, 20 bucks. Um, and within a day, we raised you know, like $500 to buy a flat screen uh, TV for, for this house. Um, we, we did some more activities. We did some art activities and had kids come in and uh, um, um, upstairs in one of our artists, what's now occupied by, an, uh, by a studio, a couple artist studios upstairs, we um, put some cardboard over the floors and uh, started doing some events uh, for kids in the neighborhood, uh, doing little art projects. Um, downstairs, we um, 
uh, again, did some more activities um, with neighbors and friends. Um, this was a little project, a card making project that uh, we organized. Um, I think it was over Valentine's Day where we had kids come and make their own cards. And uh, we also started doing some uh, house concerts, and so uh, we tapped into uh, some of the uh, music mu uh, music staff over at Lawrence University, and uh, this jazz trio came uh, back on March 14th, um, and we asked for suggested donations, all of which went to the band, um, and uh, <clears throat> started doing more and more house concerts um, as a way to raise money and um, try to pay the utilities and, and uh, also support the artists and musicians in the neighborhood. Uh, did some projects outside. Well, somebody uh, volunteered, uh, saw what we were doing. A uh, neighbor decided to build us a um, tiny library, uh, which we put up on the corner uh, to, to help activate this, this little commercial corner. Um, and then as more and more people got involved and started to see what was happening, we did a garage sale um, to raise some money to um, uh, buy some paint and to fix up the porch. Uh, so you can see there, uh, that this house is actually in pretty bad shape at the time and uh, kind of crumbling down um, structurally pretty good shape but cosmetically uh, not, not doing so good. Um, so this, this went on for about three or four months um, uh, trying to sort of figure out, okay, now that we have this, this building, how do we make it financially sustainable? How do we really do something positive for the neighborhood? Um, and by now we had sort of the two couples involved and probably three or four other um, uh, friends and, and including some new friends that we had just met through this project. Um, we were really struggling, how do we make this thing financially viable? And um, <clears throat> I reached, actually reached out to David at this time and uh, asked him to do some, uh, do a little bit of market research for me to help me sort of brainstorm or think about, you know, what we could do in this space. and. Uh, um, despite, you know, some positive things about this location, there's some decent traffic, there's a few existing businesses, it's a fairly, you know, nice, you know, neighborhood. Um, we, we, we sort of came to the realization that there wasn't really any logical uh, sort of low-hanging fruit um, type of business to go after. You know, the, the cost for, up for uh, the tenant improvements that would be necessary to bring in a coffee shop, for example, just made it financially impossible to do that. So. David encouraged me to think about um, uh, the sort of broader goal of, of creating a neighborhood asset or, and a neighborhood social gathering place and encouraged me to think about sort of developing a matrix and thinking about, you know, what are the demands for social activity in this, in this district, in this neighborhood? Um, what, what might those demands be? You know, is it movies? Is it a guy's night out? Is it... Uh, teaching people how to um, do crafts or play music? Is it having a gallery? Um, is it watching Packer games? Is it carving pumpkins? Uh, and then start thinking about how do we quantify the demand for, the, um, for what in the neighborhood for those various uses? And so that sort of shifted my focus and as a sort of social entrepreneur here from a business-minded sort of approach and in, in, in what service or product could we make money at or could someone make money at to, to more of a, of a social uh, emphasis, um, what is the demand for social activities in the neighborhood? And around this time, um, I started going out and exploring, okay, what are some different options, um, you know, what are some different ways in which we could sort of um, foster social activity in the neighborhood? And um, I came back to um, this Italian working man's club example from my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, this, uh, this club's been around for over 100 years. It currently has a restaurant in the basement. Um, but the club was formed uh, back in, I think, 1914, 1915 by Italian immigrants. And um, they uh, basically, over the first couple of years, um, uh, got this thing, bootstrapped this thing up and running with uh, charter members that contributed their uh, some money, pocket change, but more importantly, their their own um, uh, efforts in terms of working to um, uh, improve and fix up this this uh, building on on uh, Regent Street. Uh, and so this idea of maybe doing some type of club or um, some type of social club started to emerge as a way to perhaps you know, finance this this um, location and. Um, be financially sustainable. 
so that in turn sort of um, about, I guess we kept exploring this concept um, and then I think it was probably um, about six or seven months ago, uh, we basically decided to move forward and, and create a, a, a club, a nonprofit association. Um, we came up with a one-page set of bylaws. Um, we came up with some marketing materials. We reached out and got some artists involved in terms of helping us think about creatively marketing the space. And we uh, sort of took a jump, uh, a leap of faith, and uh, went out and asked people via our Facebook page if they would be interested in joining the club. And uh, we've, we're up to about 40, 45 dues-paying members that uh, pay into this club um, on a monthly basis, $10, $20 a month, which has allowed us to essentially um, create a revenue stream to continue to fix up and invest uh, in this space. Uh, meanwhile, we've got a couple artist studio spaces uh, and a pottery studio, um, and this uh, energy and excitement has sort of fed off of itself and helped us to uh, keep the momentum going. Uh, we've hired uh, an architect and uh, come up with plans to uh, meet our ADA requirements and uh, our intent this summer is to gain, uh, gain our commercial certificate of occupancy uh, to once we uh, meet code uh, as a commercial business. Uh, meanwhile, we're tapping into our members and other folks in the neighborhood. Um, again, a lot of people just sort of wandering by, wondering what's going on, and uh, we've been able to sort of Amish style um, build up and fix up this sort of run down um, uh, house um, into a commercial uh, business. Uh, we've been tapping into you know, artists and creative types along the way to help us sort of think about branding and, and marketing the space. And um, so that in turn has allowed us to um, generate some revenue that's uh, making this place you know, commercially viable. Um, so this, uh, I think, sort of case study um, I think it's, it, I thought this was a relevant case study in that it sort of um, helps us think about creative alternative approaches to activating neighborhoods and downtowns, um, coming up with alternative ways to promote sociability and third place functions, um, the idea of lighter, quicker, cheaper, and, and sort of tactically going about creating positive change in your community, um, and, and, and really sort of dovetails into some of David's comments regarding the, just the importance of smaller interventions and coming up with, with solutions that don't necessarily cost a fortune to implement and yet provide a huge return on investment. Uh, we've had over 155 events um, at this uh, venue since it was up, up and running you know, just under a year and a half ago. Um, we have been able to activate this space with uh, everything from movie nights to packer parties to house concerts to um, uh, guitar lessons um, to salon nights um, to neighborhood uh, association meetings and I've uh, been able to do it basically on a, on a shoestring. I'm going to move into my second case study here which um, is downtown Appleton and uh, my uh, home as well. Um, this case study is really um, talking about a, a professional project. Um, our firm was hired recently to assist the, the city with a uh, rewrite of its downtown master plan. And, um, and in, as we get moving on this project, um, I've been thinking a lot about the central social district uh, concept and how we might apply that. And um, struck me that Appleton is a, is a community that could benefit from, from applying some of these principles. Um, Appleton's a community that uh, in a lot of ways um, has a fairly successful downtown. There's a lot of great things happening in the downtown. It does have a performing arts center and a library. Um, it does have a number of restaurants, a fairly uh, vibrant entertainment district. And yet, despite all those wonderful things that are happening, this, this um, view down the street is probably fairly typical of many downtowns um, you may, where oftentimes um, there, you just don't see that many people out on the street. Uh, in particular, outside of the sort of eight to five, nine to five hours, and so um, we start thinking about you know David's framework uh, for for the central social district strategy. You know, what are some of the existing and potential strengths we could leverage um, in order to grow the the central social district? And one of the things that the city's uh, done pretty well at is really looking at um, 
at, at activating uh, downtown spaces. It's got a very successful um, bid and, uh, and downtown organization, Appleton Downtown Incorporated, or ADI. It has, it's a city that's um, committed to uh, investing in downtown um, through museums, uh, through the arts, um, through the library, through the transit center. Uh, so it's a community that sort of gets the importance of, of quality of life and attaining and re retaining and attracting people uh, because of a, of a high quality of life in a vibrant downtown district. Uh, so how do we create more spaces like this um, as we think about in the context of a master plan? Uh, what do we do then to, you know, what are the short-term, long-term steps that we might take to create more vibrant, activated uh, social spaces in, in, in our downtowns? Um, we've got a lot of housing uh, that's going on in, in downtown um, Appleton, um, in particular along the river. Uh, there's a photo of some new um, apartments and condos that are going up uh, in, a, in a development along the Fox River that's adjacent to, um, to our downtown. Um, at the same time, uh, we've got a pretty active, um, uh, as I mentioned, ADI downtown group that's taken um, a series of sort of short-term steps to really activate the central social district functions downtown. So this is a photo uh, from a little parklet project I was involved with, uh, with a creative downtown committee, um, where we took a, a basically an abandoned smoking lounge and over the period of a couple months, um, got to pull together a cross-section of the community, a number of businesses, city, uh, volunteers, artists, ADI, and were able to um, get people involved in sort of reimagining this little <clears throat> smoker's lounge and um, through some uh, painting, uh, throwing up some lights, um, putting up some planters, working with some local artisans, we quickly um, <clears throat> converted this space uh, into a little parklet where um, that now attracts uh, people uh, into the downtown. So when there's events or other things happening, all of a sudden we've got benches, places for people to sit, shade. Um, we've created an informal entertainment venue, uh, to use David's words, um, that's uh, helped activate uh, the downtown. As we look at sort of longer term additions or larger projects, um, again, oftentimes we think of, of sort of obvious things like putting in a park. Um, and uh, some of the other communities we've worked with have, are starting to look at, you know, what is the economic return on investment of a downtown park and how do we quantify that. Um, but even parks uh, can be expensive and, and um, certainly are expensive um, for a lot of communities. Um, this is a picture from uh, a larger picture, a zoom out picture from Central Park Plaza in Valparaiso, Indiana that David mentioned earlier. But uh, this, this park has been tremendously um, important in terms of um, uh, drawing people out at all different times of the day that, that then in, in turn um, help uh, support the local businesses. Um, and this, this area was actually, this is right along their sort of downtown Main, main Street. Um, and this is a photo of one of their summertime concert series. So as we think about Appleton and our project and we're just getting going, one of the things we're doing is just starting out and, and trying to map what are our CSD components. And so taking that list that David showed earlier, combining some of the categories, and then thinking about what, what do we have currently that we can start to leverage, um, what, what are the different uses that we have, where are they, um, and, and what, how do we sort of build off of those strengths. Um, can't really see, to see this map here. This is kind of a work in progress, but that's exactly what we've started to do. We've taken the categories I showed on the last screen, and now we're systematically going in and mapping out where all these different social functions are uh, relative to the downtown and the sort of the periphery, and start thinking about um, where, these, where these different uses are and, and what the sort of friction points are um, as we look at, at developing our, our plan for the downtown. One of the things that um, that we're that, that's obvious uh, again, sort of with the parklets um, in terms of short-term steps, uh, is just getting more uh, restaurants, more eating uh, happening out on the street. The notion of embracing the street, and so one of the short-term strategies that's been discussed is just um, freeing up, um, you know, developing, loosening up some codes and requirements, figuring out what we can do ordinance-wise to make it easier for businesses to have eating and dining out on the street. Um, 
some of the other short-term steps are murals, um, uh, looking at public art, um, doing more pop-up programming, um, creating more events, uh, looking at downtown first floor office spaces. We've got a pretty high occupancy downtown, but we unfortunately have quite a bit of first floor office space that um, precludes uh, more um, sort of social functions within those spaces. Uh, so that's one of the sort of shorter term steps we're looking at taking. Longer term, um, again, sort of going back to the notion of what are some longer term additions that, that might get put in place. And so looking longer term and, and bigger, uh, we're thinking about what are the bigger assets that we have, um, how can those be complemented or stitched together. Um, and we're very fortunate here to have a, a performing arts center um, that uh, it is very successful on a number of different metrics. Um, last year, the last season, um, the, uh, the PAC brought in over 197,000 visitors, uh, hosted 358 events. 87% uh, of operational expenses were, um, were uh, paid for through event revenue, with, uh, leaving only 13% for donations and grants. <clears throat> and uh, the PAC has recently met its goals, long-term goals for endowment fundraising after having raised $25 million. Um, but one of the other important interesting metrics that I that I found here was that over that 94 percent of the visitors come from within less than an, an hour away um, and so that tells me um, that you've got most people coming from the immediate metro area and so that that starts um, you know that that in one way is very positive because it means that they are in all likelihood you know have the opportunity or time to patronize um, additional restaurants um, and, and that at this end of town, we've got a number of restaurants that are very successful, but um, how, do we, how do we build in additional um, opportunities to activate this space and to take advantage of those visitors? And quite frankly, um, how do we address uh, the fact that <clears throat> this, uh, while this space, this uh, PAC is very successful, um, it, it off, oftentimes uh, is, uh, looks exactly like it does in this photo, uh, empty, vacant. Um, Kind of a pedestrian dead zone. So, but uh, so, how do what could we do to act? You know, to activate and utilize this space when there aren't events going on, and then what other central social district functions can we think about tying into this to leverage the the visitors that do visit? Another long ter longer term addition that we'll be playing uh, into our strategy is the library. Uh, the city of Appleton spent a number of years and quite a bit of money looking at a downtown library and this is a rendering of a of a of a proposed library on a bluff site um, this this particular location was um, uh, shot down at the last at the prior city council meeting and so exactly where and when and if the library gets built is still up in the air but as we think about the library and how important that is uh, to, in terms of bringing people downtown um, we were thinking um, about how that can be tied into other central social district functions. So, for example, the city's um, there's a very important senior center downtown Appleton that just um, is about to close its doors um, because its uh, host is no longer able to maintain that space. So, we're trying to we'll be looking at opportunities. Um, is there an opportunity to integrate a senior center into a library? Is there an opportunity to integrate additional housing into a library? Um, in a future library, um, you know, what, what other uses um, could play off of um, activate and support a library uh, as we look at the downtown. So um, the, I took the, some of the next steps in terms of your CSD strategy and developing that plan. I kind of boiled down into sort of five different categories here, and I've talked about the first four. Um, but we thinking a little bit about um, you know, the challenges specifically with Appleton and what, what challenges you might have to overcome. I think Appleton's probably similar to a lot of communities in terms of overcoming the challenges. I think biggest, first and foremost, of course, is always money. And so I think the work that David does um, uh, is, is critically important in terms of building that business case for some of these functions. So. Um, Oftentimes, it's easy to go out and, and, and come up with multipliers for putting it in an exhibition center, for example, but how do we build the business case and get the business community and, uh, and the community to rally behind some of these other um, less sexy projects? So how do we quantify the market demand? 
um, how do we create an economic business case for some you know, informal entertainment venues? Um, and then um, uh, how do we um, sell that uh, and, uh, and bring uh, partners on board? In terms of the strategies or innovative strategies then for, for employing CSD um, uh, projects, um, the, I think the public-private partnerships, and, and some of these David talked about, are, are absolutely critical. Uh, so again, getting back to the library example, are, are there public-private partnerships where we can build a library or a other downtown asset that uh, will create um, tax revenue um, but also prov and provide business opportunity uh, while bringing in additional housing or hosting a senior center, for example. Um, other uh, innovative strategies, I think, that pertain to the CSD is uh, ideas uh, we're going to be looking at is a uh, public art plan. Uh, so rather than sort of uh, um, uh, ad hoc basis, build, putting up murals and pop-up galleries and, and public art, uh, do we develop a public art plan? Uh, do we look at strategically a long-range public art plan that actually helps um, guide and, and, and stitch together um, existing and future um, uh, uh, entertainment venues uh, in and around our downtown, and what what do we how do we bring those together and create sort of the, the little trail of breadcrumbs that, that leads you from destination to destination within your downtown. And so, in conclusion, uh, so we'll leave a few minutes for um, Q and A. A uh, couple of my concluding remarks here, and um, David, if you want to jump in uh, on a few concluding remarks when I'm done, uh, please do so. As I look at this, I think the CSD concept can be applied at multiple scales, and so I've, I've found it a useful construct in terms of the, the little the 602 Club project I've been working on personally. Um, I think um, embracing, um, I think there is a huge demand for more social activity in our communities. Oftentimes that's evidenced by, uh, you know, just the growth and the desire for more coffee shops, more third places. and so. This concept, I think it fits in small towns, it fits in big cities, it fits, it fits in downtowns, it fits in neighborhoods. Um, the arts and, and entertainment, I think, are really critical um, at different scales, um, again, because they engage us and they help us connect with each other. And so, um, again, it's, it's about people and it's about um, getting people, giving people the opportunity to, to uh, share their talents and to contribute to something meaningful and connect with others. Uh, so I just I think the arts in particular is, are so critically important to this uh, idea. The lighter, quicker, cheaper moniker that from the pod project from public spaces and, and um, again I think is really critical um, and it's certainly been the focus of my efforts with the 602 Club. But I think that focusing solely on that is is can be a little misguided. I think it's also important for us to be looking at. How do we mesh those lighter, quicker, cheaper interventions with a bigger, you know, with larger capital projects and investments in the downtown? And, and how, do, how do we make those financially sustainable? Um, and then how do we uh, leverage both those sort of grassroots efforts with the larger, uh, more expensive capital projects that are happening? And, and how do you get those two to, to sort of work together hand in glove? David, do you want to? Um, you got any f final thoughts, or should we open up with Q and A? Uh, let me just make one one uh, comment here. Uh, one of my hobby horses that I, I really want to uh, uh, push is uh, people watching is often the simplest and most important kind of entertainment, and often uh, if you can build on that. Uh, you get some very, very powerful uh, uh, leverage, and uh, the the uh, success of Dan Biederman's uh, Bryan Park. I'm using that as an example. Is he has put in all these venues where people do things, and they, in a sense, are performing, uh, entertaining all the other people that are in the view shed uh, surrounding them uh, uh, in that park, and in turn, those people who are entertaining will later or perhaps at the same instantaneous moment be entertained by the other people on the park. And that concept, has, uh, I think, is, is one to ke keep in mind all the time because I think anytime you get that kind of connection going 
uh, you're, you're building strength for your downtown's entertainment niche and for your downtown central social district. Okay, that was it. Okay, are we ready for Q and A? Andrew and David, are you ready? Oh yes, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Right away. All right. Um, <clears throat> these first couple questions are for David. Uh, why is the Somerville, New Jersey pedestrian mall working while most fail? Uh, what does the programming entail? Uh, I, I wish I knew definitively what the answer to that is. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, considering that. One of the things I don't think I don't think so much as the specific programming. I think it has to do more with that. It's only a one block long pedestrian mall. Uh, and where it's situated, um, uh, uh, and um, I really, uh, I wish I could tell you more. I am, I am looking at it still, uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid I, I have not been able to come up with a good, with a good I would have written an article about it, believe me, if, if I had the answer on that. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, th this question here actually is for either one of you. Um, what are the keys to making a successful downtown social district coexist peacefully with the downtown residential area without there being conflict? Andrew? Well, I guess I would share. I'm not sure. I, I guess I don't see there being huge conflict here um, in, you know, I do, I think the one, a lot of what we talked about here, you know, especially in terms of these informal entertainment districts would seem to lend themselves quite nicely to, you know, surrounding neighborhoods and additional housing in and around a downtown. Um, I think, you know, maybe where there's, um, you know, some of the larger, uh, like the packs that we talked about, the museums, you know, oftentimes from a land use perspective, those can have be more of a dramatic change in land use that might negatively impact people. But, um, you know, I think a lot of the CSD functions are going to be complementary uses that are going to be attractive to, you know, residents, you know, having additional eating, dining opportunities, having more parks, having, you know, more informal entertainment venues. I would think a lot of those would be pretty um, sim sympathetic to uh, adjacent neighborhoods. I think that downtown residential is absolutely essential. It's the key, one of the key components of a, of a strong uh, uh, CSD, um, and uh, um, you know it helps put people, uh, you know, uh, pedestrian traffic to the street brings immediate customers for uh, local establishments that help make them a success and adds a certain assuredness of a sense of vibrancy, etc. Now you know there are. Uh, you know, certain kinds of establishments, you know, be it a honky-tonk music player, the noise goes out, you know, you know, or a bar or, you know, uh, where you have those kinds of problems. I mean, here in Kew Gardens, New York, which is not a downtown, just a neighborhood, we have a bar that's causing problems for nearby residents. Uh, and I guess, you know, that has to do with code and code enforcement and police activity. And that would be the case wherever the, the annoyer you know, the offending venue is is located. Um, um, but I, I, you know, I guess if there's an outdoor concert like in Valparaiso, if there are residents nearby, maybe that noise would be considered. You know, the music would be considered noise by some. But uh, uh, and maybe a, a barbecue place would be putting off smells that are offensive. Again, I think it gets down more to you know to code and code enforcement. And the person asking the question just typed in and said they were, in fact, referring to Club 602, which is a, a bar nightlife type venue. So you, you were you were on the dot there for that one. Um, OK, uh, we, we have a couple questions about some acronyms that, that the two of you were thrown around. The first one was a TIF, a TIF, which um, is tax increment financing for those. Go ahead and <laughs> go ahead and look that one up and, and have a good evening reading about 
tax increment financing. The, the second one is um, folks are asking what a PAC is, PAC, which is, is that a planning advisory committee? That's performing just arts. a per, yeah, performing arts center. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Um, so for those folks asking about those questions, uh, next one, um, Andrew, has Appleton provided any help or funding? Um, for our little, for our 602 Club project, no, not yet. Uh, we're hopeful that they might. They, they have been very, um, very uh, um, accommodating in terms of working through some of the code and kind of business requirement issues for the 602 Club project and in terms of dealing with parking and other kind of land use issues. Um, but we haven't received any, you know, public funding for our project. Okay. And is the 602 Club say, building... Oh, I'm Christine, sorry. Go ahead. Christine, can I just say publicly, I love what Andrew and his friends have done there. I think that in terms of community building and the whole notion of a central social district, it's you know it's it's not a kind of normal you know quick shoot from the hip kind of solution uh, to an issue or to think about uh, it. it uh, I think it's it's quite quite inventive and a, a, a model I hope others will find appealing and will follow. And uh, Andrew, you did great work. I agree. Thank you. I think this is pretty awesome. And there's there's a lot of people asking questions, which means they want to know more about it. Um, is the 602 Club project is it tax exempt right now? And we do we do have a Facebook page set up. It's just the 602 Club. Um, yeah, we're getting our um, incorporation. We're filing our paperwork. Um, we've just kind of set up our bylaws and created a nonprofit association and so it is a tax exempt uh, entity however the building itself is not owned by the club the building itself is owned by the um, my <clears throat> four business partners which have an LLC called neighborhood investments LLC so the property itself will still be taxable uh, which I think is important because in in our downtown uh, something like half of the property in our downtown, in part because we have a university uh, and these other nonprofits, half of our, our taxable land is, is non-taxable. So, um, in fact, this space will continue to be privately um, owned, the land. Okay, great. Um, is a, a, the CSD, is it an actual district, like a CBD or a historic district, something that's delineated? Or does it not have a formal boundary? Well, it, I, I've never seen anything, anyone actually delineate the boundaries. If for some planning reason, if for you know, if it was being considered in the zoning, and perhaps in the kind of work that Andrew is doing in Appleton, maybe headed in that direction. I don't know. We haven't talked. About, he hasn't discussed that with me at all. Uh, but. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's really, you know, if you just identify your inventory of CSD venues and, you know, describe that geographically, you've, you've outlined your CSD district. Okay. And is a CSD a component of an economic development plan or vice versa? Is an economic development plan part of a, a component of the CSD? Um, are they separate initiatives? Well, I, th I think that uh, any I'm doing uh, a, uh, any, a retail revitalization strategy out in Laramie, Wyoming, and, and uh, uh, I, we're definitely going to be considering the CSD aspects in our work there. And I think that in the future, more and more downtown revitalization uh, strategies, if, if they are going to be successful, have, have to consider uh, the CSD aspects. And as I, you know, the premise of this presentation is that they're getting to be more and more important as retail is, is kind of uh, stagnating or decreasing. Only in very few places is it growing. Okay, great. And uh, can you speak a little bit about how transit, sidewalks, and parking play a role in this? Well, I'll chime in, you know, briefly, and David, feel free to piggyback. But uh, you know, I think thinking about mobility, um, 
obviously is you know hugely important. Um, the way I sort of think about this, and in in, in part uh, uh, um, be, through my work with David, is is um, really thinking about your district or where you're working. You know, first and foremost, from a market standpoint, you know, what are the mar what's the market demand for? Um, in the in and around the downtown or wherever you're working, and and what's interesting about what David sort of turned me on to with the 602 Club was it's not just the market for say coffee or widgets, but what's the market for social activities? And I think we're starting with sort of in my in my mind you start with what is the demand uh, factor. Uh, from there, we're looking. Um, this is how I, you know, we'll be doing this in, in Appleton. You know, from there, what are the what are the uses then? You know, as we look across the landscape, what are the various uses, um, and what where could you plug in or fulfill that demand, um, and and geographically, and then finally, um, what's the mobility look like? Uh, what do you need from a mobility standpoint to support the desired, uh, you know, land uses or program uses? And so, I think. It's sort of the tail wagging the dog to think, you know, first about the mobility. It's, you know, it's important to sort of think through the market, the land use, and then the mobility, and how that um, supports um, your your goals and objectives for for downtown. But I, I I do think it's important to be thinking, you know, more obviously more broadly than just transportation. It is mobility, uh, bike, pedestrian, transit, car sharing, um, uh, et cetera. I, I think that uh, you know the, the, the walkability notion, uh, you know, is absolutely essential and pivotal to a successful uh, downtown central social district. Um, you know, if you don't have that, and, and then the sidewalks, of course, go into that. Uh, and uh, you know, the sidewalks often become entertainment. Uh, you, you know, they then use themselves famously uh, in, in many. You know. Uh, of strong downtowns, um, the transportation um, uh, it j it just seems to me that the car. I know we talk in a car, uh, etc. But uh, uh, I, I think that. Uh, the car, oops. Um, uh, you, you know, it is just not a proper um, mechanism to to. That's part of the central social uh, central social district con concept, except from getting for people to get sometimes to the place. Okay, um, uh, we're going to have to wrap up. It is two thirty. Uh, for those folks that didn't get their questions answered, please feel free to contact our speakers directly, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any any final questions that you have. Um, so to uh, uh, Andrew Dane and David Milder and the Wisconsin chapter, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this was a, a great session. We had an incredible number of attendees. So thanks to everyone for joining us. And uh, we'll see. Well, we'll talk to everyone next time. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you.